You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 30, 2011, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, air sampling. Our presenter is Dr. Charles Barnes. He's the Director of Allergy Research at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. our presenter today. Our first presenter is Dr. Charles Barnes. Dr. Barnes is the Director of Allergy Research here at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. Uh, he's also in charge of our air sampling uh, project. Uh, we've been collecting air samples for uh, almost 15 years now, uh, and uh, the method of doing that have changed over the years, and uh, uh, it's time for an update on how that is done. So without any further delay, I will turn the podium over to Dr. Charles Barnes. Okay. Well, we're gonna we're gonna go over uh, general methods for air sampling for pollen and spores, and we'll go over not only the way we do it here at Children's Mercy, but also some of the historic ways that have uh, have been done. And and the the method actually hasn't changed that much, and the concept is very simple. You just uh, pull in everything that's in the air, you and a certain fraction of the air. You uh, impact it on a glass slide that's coated with some sort of substance that makes it sticky, and you take it. Then you take the slide down and you stain for pollen and and uh, put on some contrast, maybe for spores, and look at it under the microscope and arrive at a statistical estimate of the total spores in the air. Let's see, that here. Click it, and then I can do that. No. Excuse me. Uh, you can use the flow and arrow. There we go. Okay. Uh, so, you know, they, they've got a format for this now, so we've got questions. Um, which of the following is commonly used to collect air samples for aeroallergen estimation? Uh, weather balloons, remote control aircraft, house dust, a Hearst spore trap, or a spectrophotometer? And um, we don't have the little forms here, but the questions probably are on the forms, too. Okay, the second one, which of the following is a common aeroallergen in Kansas City? Oak, ragweed, elm, grass, or all of the above? And the third is, which of the following mathematical manipulations is used to produce airborne pollen counts and pollen grains per cubic meter of air? And the first one is you square the radius of the collector times 3.14 and divide by the speed of the fan or you divide the number of pollen grains collected in 24 hours by the volume of air sample per day, or third, you multiply the number of pollen grains collected per minute times 60 minutes per hour times 24 hours a day, or all of the above. That's that way. The right arrow. The other arrow, the right, yeah. yeah. Okay. And so our objectives are to understand how air samples are taken for outdoor pollen and spore counts, to understand how air samples are taken for indoor pollen, I mean indoor spore counts, generally you don't count pollen indoors, although we do see pollen indoors, uh, at all times of the year. Uh, we can see ragweed in indoor air at all times of the year. They get stuck in the HVAC system and go blowing around. Uh, and we're going to review some of the major outdoor and indoor air allergens in the Kansas City area. Okay, so these are some of the collectors that are commonly used. Uh, this is the Hearst spore trap style that we use, and this is a, a spore trap manufactured by Burkhardt. This is a very similar spore trap manufactured by an Italian company named Lanzoni. Uh, this is a rotor rod device, which is a very good device for collecting pollen. It has very low efficiency for spores, especially small spores. And this is a, uh, another spore trap basically turned on its side that was manufactured by Allergenco for many years. And Allergenco has been bought up by EMS Sales, which is one of the major uh, uh, suppliers for industrial hygienists in the country. And uh, these are may still be available, but they may have, have uh, sold the last one. But this is a very nice sampler, and, and nowadays this collection head here because air is pulled in the top and drawn into a slide that's lying on a horizontal surface. 
uh, this collection mechanism here is now used in a plastic format and a disposable one-time, one-use only collector that we'll look at in just a few minutes here. Okay, so the first thing I want to look at is, is the Hearst Spore Trap, and this is an old publication uh, with a diagram of a Hearst Spore Trap in here, and basically it's just a tube that pulls a vacuum into a cylinder that's got a clock on the top of it, and this is a blow-up of the cylinder, and basically the clock here is just winding up a string and the slide is attached to the, slit, the string, and there's a small slit here, and so there's a vacuum pulled on the chamber, air comes rushing in the slit, goes impacting onto the slide, and the slide gradually moves past the slit as the clock uh, turns around. And so this is a, a very simple mechanism, but was, um, was used for many years, and the mechanism we use now is, is basically just a slight modification of this. And it draws ambient air in, uh, generally at 10 liters a minute, although some collectors can be set for 15 liters a minute and some collectors can be set for 2 or 3 liters a minute. Um, and typically they're made to operate on the format of a slide uh, or a continuous uh, plastic tape that uh, is also this, that's about the same format as a slide. Okay, so this uh, these pictures were taken by James Anderson in Ontario, Canada, and they're they're really nice pictures, and uh, he did a wonderful job of it. But it il illustrates the Burkhart collector, and these are the collectors that are used by the National Allergy Bureau, and, and our collection station here is part of the National Allergy Bureau. And you can see uh, the Burkhart collector is basically a fan on the bottom to draw a vacuum in the uh, chamber here, a slit on the front of the chamber that allows air from the outside to come in, a guard here that protects it from rain, although we can get so heavy a rain in, in our area that we do get rain on the slide and interferes with the collection a little bit, and a wind vane that turns the top of the whole mechanism here. There's a, a bearing here that, uh, that it turns on, and so the wind vane makes sure that we're always facing into the wind so that theoretically anyway we always have a the same volume of air coming through the slit or the orifice here at the same time. And this is one of the, the head or the collectors that actually goes into the top here. And here's a slide mounted on the collector and there's a clock uh, underneath. And basically the clock turns one turn in the 24 hour period and it's set to draw the slide or at least 48 millimeters of the slide by the collecting orifice in a 24-hour period, so about two millimeters an hour there. And this is the kind of collection you get, and you can you can tell that this slide probably um, went on early in the morning because this is more than likely morning rush hour, this is more than likely evening rush hour, and since this, I suppose, is Canada, not much goes on at night, and this is the, the nighttime where there's not a whole lot of traffic. And um, then we see a very similar pattern in Kansas City where we see a, a, uh, a strong collection in the morning when we have our morning rush hour and a strong collection in the evening when we have our evening rush hour and then not much as the automobiles settle down and the, the dust gets stirred up. So uh, it's pretty obvious from this that most of the dust or a lot of the dust that gets stirred up in the air comes from human activity and not necessarily so much from wind activity. Okay, and this is just sort of what the collector looks like from the top. There's a little bar up there that you push down. You simply lift the head out, uh, replace the slide on a daily basis, put the head back in, put the bar back in place, and, and wind the clock uh, once a week, and you're ready to, ready to collect. And so it's a very simple mechanism. Uh, this is an up-close picture of the collecting orifice, and so air is pulled through here and smaller material is, is accelerated and goes smashing into the slide that's mounted here. This is the mount actually for the head right here. And so it impacts onto the slide and moves, the slide moves in front of the collecting head in a, over a 24 hour period. And then this is the winding stem for the clock. And this is a different head. This is the 
head that will last for seven days. And so this mechanism is also set up so that you can put on a piece of plastic tape that's coated in grease and let it collect for seven days. And, and that way you only have to attend the collector once in every seven days. However, we like to put out a daily count, at least on weekdays. And so for weekdays, we use the, the slide and, and examine the slide every day. OK. And so yeah, this is just the way that the slide is changed. This slide simply, simply slips out. And then a new slide is slipped in on a daily basis. And, and winding the clock, uh, how many people in here have ever wound the clock? Yeah, I wound I wound the clock. I wind this when I actually have a clock at home and I wind. But that's one of the problems that we're running that we run into is uh, no one in the modern world knows how to wind a clock. I mean, it doesn't seem to be that simple, but it, it actually takes a little skill. You can overwind these things. You can wind them too often. You can wind them not frequently enough. Uh, it, it does take a little skill to operate. We've had some trouble with that. Uh, and then. For well, the drum, this is the drum collector right here and with a, a nut that holds it in place. And it's simply coat, it has a piece of plastic strip around the side that's coated in grease. And it, again, moves in front of the orifice at the rate of 2 millimeters an hour. And so over the period of seven days, uh, it moves by for seven 48 millimeter strips. And to evaluate these, you simply cut them into daily links and mount them on slides and look at them under the microscope, just like we did before. OK. And this is, this is how the, uh, the nut gets screwed onto the collector. And there's a little guy here that tells you where to start it. And the little green tells you which direction it moves in. And this is between the two black lines is where you uh, tape the new piece of cellophane onto the uh, head so that you know that this is your start and finish area. And you know when you've got the head off that it was moving this way. That's what the little green thing is for, to tell you exactly which direction. Because you, it's possible to get these tapes turned around, in, in which case you're measuring time backwards instead of forwards. OK. And, this is a, and, there, and you know, that was just one kind of collector. This is another kind of collector. Uh, there are actually quite a few people out there doing this. Uh, this gentleman has got four Petri dishes in small collectors here on the wings of his airplane. And in front of each Petri dish, he's got a little uh, butterfly valve that he can control remotely. And so he will fly this airplane to a certain height above the ground and open one of these things, let it collect for a minute on the Petri dish, close that one, move his airplane to a different altitude, open the Petri dish, and collect again. Now, these guys were collecting uh, blue mold that grows on tobacco plants. And it turns out the blue mold starts uh, every year in Cuba and moves across to Florida and then moves up into the Carolinas and Kentucky, where the tobacco crops are. And there, for many years, there was a tremendous amount of research money put into controlling the blue mold on tobacco, because tobacco was a major cash crop. And so uh, you can see every now and then, uh, air collecting and spore collecting can really uh, come in handy. OK. So that was one alternative sampler. The other alternative samplers are the Lanzoni, which is the spore trap, the rotor rod, which we looked at before, and the allergen coat. Um, rotor rod uh, is a very interesting collector. Uh, they've been out there for quite a while, and they are currently owned by Multidata, which is in itself owned by SDI, which is Surveillance Data Incorporated, which is a large corporation that collects lots of observable data and sells information. Uh, and one of the places they sell information is, or actually what one of the places ways they sell information is that they run pollen.com. And you can go to pollen.com and get a pollen forecast. Um, and they've got sites all over the country that have collected data for them. And so they have a database set up. And, and from this database, they are uh, using a mechanism that they will not divulge. 
uh, predict pollen counts in certain areas. And, and sometimes uh, their predictions are pretty good. I mean, you know, this, uh, especially earlier this month, if you predicted ragweed in Kansas City, you'd pretty much be right most of the time. But there are notable exceptions where their, their forecasts are not right. Um, pollen forecasting depends on weather forecasting, and you know how more accurate weather forecasting is sometimes. So uh, anyway, yeah, they, uh, they, they sell commercial space on this website, and they sell their predictions. So you, you can see their predictions probably on the Weather Channel and other places like that. Uh, and this prediction is sponsored by a company that makes antihistamines, typically. Uh, generally over-the-counter antihistamines, you know, Zyrtec or Claritin or, or Benadryl or something like that. And so, uh, you know, so it's, it's very easy to, to imagine that people who are worried about pollen counts would probably be allergic and they would probably want to buy antihistamines. And so if, you're, if your pollen count is supported by an antihistamine company, they would say, well, maybe this is a good antihistamine for me to buy. Okay, this is a this is a rotor rod. This is two different kinds of rotor rods, and basically it's just a motor with some sort of timing mechanism on it. And on the bottom is a on the bottom the uh, the uh, shaft of the motor is sticking out, and there's some sort of mechanism to hold a lucite rod. And the lucite rod is coated in grease, just like we coat slides. And uh, for a certain time period out of the day, the rod will spin in the air. And so since this is spinning in a circle, uh, it doesn't matter which way the wind is blowing, it's not going to change uh, its impaction with wind direction. So it will be pretty much impervious to wind <coughs> direction. It doesn't need the weather vane to keep it pointing into the wind. Uh, and also, uh, uh, these things do a pretty good job of collecting pollen. Uh, because of the pollen is larger and will go impact and will impact very readily, on the glass slides here. And so to count this, you basically take the slide, and the, the slide can either be attached permanently or it can be attached in a mechanism that allows it to unfold so it's a little protected from the weather. It unfolds when it spins, and when it's not spinning, it folds back into a protected area. And you take one of these lucite rods, and you mount it on another lucite stage here, and look at it out of the microscope, just like you would the slide, and count the number of pollen that you've collected. And these do a very good job collecting pollen, and they do a pretty good job collecting and uh, estimating airborne concentrations of large spores. Uh, they do have some difficulty with small spores. Uh, but this is a picture of one spinning around. And, and uh, this one actually has been mounted upside down because they're not worried about the weather. Typically, they're mounted with the collectors down so that if it's raining or something, you get a little protection from the, from the elements. But uh, you can see them spin around. And so when you, when you start calculating uh, the amount of air that these things sweep through, since they're going in a circle, you generally have pi somewhere in, in the collection because you have to actually uh, calculate the volume of air that this lucite rod sweeps through in a given period of time. And so, but, but it, you know, it's a relatively simple calculation that can be done. Okay. And again, you know, there are publications out there. Uh, David Friends, who was in algae for a while, and now I, I'm not exactly sure he's a physician, and I'm not exactly sure where he's practicing. But he published several articles and was a major driver behind the rotor. Excuse me. Behind the rotor. Right. It's ragweed season. <laughs> um, and published several articles. This one demonstrates that basically for large uh, particles, including pollen, uh, the Burkhart gets about the same, excuse me, about the same values as the uh, rotor rod does. Uh, and so for pollen, uh, there are several members of the National Allergy Bureau uh, network collect only pollen, and they collect pollen with the rotor rod device. So it's, it's a good uh, mechanism for collecting pollen. <coughs> now, the other collector I wanted to go over is the Allergenco collector. And Allergenco has been bought up by EMS Sales Environmental Monitoring Systems. 
uh, which are and they're major suppliers of equipment for uh, industrial hygiene and indoor air sampling. Uh, and this is an Allergenco, and you can see it's a it has an orifice, and there's a small fan that draws a vacuum in the entire device. And since uh, it, it, you don't, the, the thing you have to remember about a vacuum is that no matter how good a vacuum you pull, the amount of force pushing on that vacuum stays constant because air is, atmospheric pressure is about 14 pounds per square inch. And so as long as you're drawing a good enough vacuum, your, your inlet velocity is not going to change that much because the air pushing in is always going to be pushing about the same amount. And so it's actually fairly easy to draw a good uh, amount of air through here. And you can see, here's the slit. This is the top, folds back. This is part of the slit. And then you mount a slide on this little carrier right here. And the way that this carrier is set is that uh, it counts down time. And after a certain time, it moves about one microscope, about one 10x microscope field apart. And so this is what you guys are looking at. This is what you guys looked at last year coming from Mercy South. And, and I've got it set up down there to collect uh, one sample every 12 hours. And so we get essentially two samples a day on this. And the nice thing about the Allergenco is you can run them on a battery or you can run them from your car. And these are very good to take into houses and collect inside houses. Um, and we did some work when we started with the Allergenco showing that for most wind speeds, as long as the wind's not blowing really fast over 15 or 20 miles an hour, uh, ambient wind speed in Kansas City is about 7 miles an hour, and we're pretty windy. So as, you know, for most wind speeds, the Allergenco is going to get the same numbers that Burkhardt gets. Okay, this is, this is the comparison here uh, for pollen uh, and for spores. And as a matter of fact, you can see uh, the Burkhardt perhaps oversamples for spores, I mean for pollen, just a little bit. So uh, maybe you can saturate the Burkhardt with pollen where it's a little harder to saturate the Allergenco. Okay, so let's go over the top ten pollens in Kansas City by appearance. And you guys haven't seen these, and you guys saw these last spring. Okay, uh, starting early in the year, we get elm, and then maple, and cedar has moved into our top three. Uh, frankly, when I first put this talk together, maybe ten years ago, uh, cedar was kind of down at the bottom, but. Cedar has really been moving into the Kansas City area. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, fields now that are that are that stay fallow, and people are spending less money on gasoline to mow these fields, and so you get a lot of cedar trees growing up, and you get a lot of cedar trees growing up along the sides of the interstates and the roads also, because uh, basically people are just not spending as much money mowing as they did, and it might have a little to do with the fact that we're getting a little warmer. We now look more like southern Missouri than we did 20 years ago. So uh, anyway, cedar is moving into our area from southern Missouri and the Ozarks down there. We also have a lot of oak trees in our area. Um, oak is, is really native to this area. There are 50-something different varieties of oak tree in Missouri. Uh, however, most of the oak trees that we collect, uh, most of the oak pollen probably came from trees that were planted. They are planted as ornamentals. Um, very, very often, and so uh, mostly Kansas City, Missouri plants elm trees for ornamentals, and Oakland Park, Kansas, and on the Kansas side, they plant oak trees, and so if you live in Kansas, you'll notice you have lots and lots of pin oak trees over there in Kansas. Mulberry is a tree that we don't notice a lot, but there actually are quite a few of them in our area. Plus, mulberry produces a tremendous amount of pollen. Uh, it's a really prolific pollen producer. And so we see a lot of mulberry in our area. And, and it turns out that the osage trees that we have around here, you guys probably don't know what an osage tree is. But this tree that produces the green ball, it's about that big around. And it has thorns on it. 
and you see them growing in fence lines and backyards all over the place, and they're almost impossible to get rid of because the wood is so tough. Uh, it's in the mulberry family, and it also it produces a pollen that looks very much like mulberry, and so probably quite a bit of the the mulberry that we count, the Morris that we count, uh, comes from the osage tree, or the hedge tree, as people call it. Uh, and then uh, these, this probably, these are our major trees. Um, I didn't put birch in here because, frankly, we've been going down. Uh, birch has you know, sort of been going down in the last several years. <coughs> but um, we'll start with the weeds. And the first weed that comes out in the spring is sorrel. Uh, and this is sorrel or dock or curly dock. Uh, and this actually can be picked and eaten. And uh, people have been known for a long time to eat sorrel as a salad or a salad green. And, but it produces a significant pollen. We see it here early. Uh, and then shortly after sorrel comes on, we get grass. And this is a major grass growing area of the country. And so we will have grass pollen in our collection um, pretty much from middle March on throughout the year. We, we have uh, spring pollens. We have summer pollen. We have spring grass uh, like fescue and, and uh, timothy. We have summer grass like Johnson grass, and we have fall grass like red top. And so we can see a little grass pollen in the collection all year round. But we get most of our grass in uh, June around here. And then plantain. Uh, again, plantain is something that you see uh, in the collection for a pretty good period of time. Uh, ragweed and kinapod, and we're in ragweed season right now, and kinapod is about the same as ragweed. And so this is elm. Uh, elm is almost or in the elm family. Uh, the pollen is very characteristic, and it's stephanoporate. There are four to, I've never seen one with seven pores, but I suppose it could have. But the thing about this is the pores are dispersed in an equatorial manner. In other words, they're all around the side of the pollen grain. Of course, you can look at this pollen grain from the side, and then it looks like a stripe across, but they're not dispersed evenly around the pollen. Uh, elm trees are just gorgeous, and they are big, spreading trees that produce a lot of shade. They were a major tree in this country uh, during the early part of the 20th century. And then early in the 20th century, we got a disease that's a fungus that's spread by a beetle. And it devastated the elm population. And certain species of elms uh, just haven't bounced back. And so we had lots and lots of dead elm trees from this, from Dutch elm disease. But there are resistant varieties. And this is one resistant variety that's planted in the field out by my house. And this is just a really big, uh, very pretty elm tree out there. Uh, maple trees. Maple, of course, is the state tree of Canada. For all of there, they have the maple leaf, a very characteristic leaf, and a very characteristic pollen with sort of a, uh, a three. Uh, so it, it's, it's got uh, triporate or triculpate. that actually has slits on it. And you see this pollen out there. And also, the maple tree is one of the major producers of the little helicopters that you see around in the spring here. Uh, and we can, uh, maple trees are adapted to grow in lots of areas. Um, this is just a maple tree that came <laughs> up uh, out, on the, out on the farm. And it's really uh, grown since I've been there. And it's grown to be a fair-sized tree. But it's uh, a tree that has a lot of protruding roots and a lot of uh, sometimes multiple trunks on it. And so it's typically uh, the wild-type elm is not a tree that gets planted for ornamental reasons. However, the silver, I mean, the, the wild-type maple, however, the silver maple, uh, which is a really pretty tree, uh, and has uh, a leaf, the underside of the leaf is almost white. It's so silver. And so silver maple is often planted as an ornamental. And they're very pretty trees. Uh, cedar. Uh, Cedar or juniper, and which means that in the same family, the Cupraceae family, uh, we get cedar trees and also fits or junipers that people plant as ornamental plants. And they produce all, all that pollen looks exactly the same. The same. And it has a, a fairly tough exine or the outer part of the pollen to it, but 
when you put it in the stains we use, the interior of the pollen swells and bursts through the outside. And so this is the characteristic look you see. You get the Pac-Man type look here on the egg side. And this is, this is then the plasma lima for the cell. And this is the internal uh, part of the pollen. And this is the external part of the pollen right here. And this is characteristically what they look like. Uh, the trees can be really large around here, and they can be really nice. Uh, and the cypress tree is actually in the same family. And so it's a large family that's got cypress and juniper and what we call cedar trees uh, around here. Mostly what we have is the western red cedar and the mountain cedar. But um, these can be prolific pollen producers. Um, you can walk up to one of these in pollen season and hit it with a stick, and you just get a puff. Hello, pollen produced. Uh, oak trees, if you park your car uh, somewhere toward the end of April in Oakland Park on Lamar or something like that, uh, and come back to it the next day, you will have a yellow coating of pollen on your car. There's so many oak trees in Oakland Park. And again, this is a tricold porate or a tri, uh, both furrows and pores here. Uh, and frankly, this is not the best picture of a of an oak pollen. I need to find a better picture of oak pollen. But oak trees can be really big and really nice around here. Uh, one interesting feature of an oak tree is it produces its pollen on these dangling structures. And this structure is known as a catkin. Uh, and along the catkin, you can see individual little flowers here. And then each of these flowers is pouring out pollen on a daily basis. And so uh, not only do you have the pollen turning your car yellow, but you have these little catkins that fall off the tree and get stuck in your gutters and everything else in the spring. And so it, it's a very interesting structure, very interesting pollen, pollination style. This is, a, this is a red oak. You can tell the type of oak by the shape of the leaf. And you can tell it's not a pin oak because a pin oak has a very sharp point in the, the leaf here. Uh, this, I think, would be a, probably a pin oak right here. Like I say, there are 50-something different kinds of oak in, uh, in the Missouri, Kansas area here. Uh, mulberry. Uh, mulberry pollen is really is small. It's generally diporate. Um, and a lot of times it doesn't stain strongly and, and you miss it. But each of these fruits here had to be each little circle on here had to be pollinated because each little circle can produce a seed. And so mulberry, in order to go through its life cycle, has to produce a lot of pollen. And typically mulberry trees are small and, and get, it's almost like a bush. But every now and then you can see in Missouri a really big mulberry tree. And this is a really big mulberry tree out in my pasture. And uh, I had an old horse who would uh, a white horse who would stand under the mulberry tree in the spring waiting for the mulberries and would consume them and stain his muzzle uh, purple with the, the mulberries that he could consume. Uh, and so the, then the first of the weeds is sorrel. And sorrel comes up uh, oh, around here sometime maybe uh, end of May, uh, maybe early May sometimes. And it grows uh, and produces a nice uh, pollen here, and you can see it grows almost like a leafy green, and so it can be consumed um, if you really uh, are interested in sorrel salad. So most people think it's a little bitter. Um, it's not bad. Um, and then grass, we have lots of grass around here. Uh, grass is all in the poor, the gravity family, so it's very common to have granules here in grass seeds. Um, and then plantain, there are two kinds of plantain. This is English plantain. The Plantago lanceolata. Uh, and this is the thing, you know, if you cut your grass and the very next day you've got these little spikes sticking up, that's, that's generally plantain uh, because they'll grow really quickly. And it starts to flower down here at the bottom. And if this uh, head stays up there and doesn't get cut down, it will flower for a couple of weeks, starting at the bottom and moving up the, up the uh, tip here until finally all of these have produced flowers and produced pollen. And so plantain pollen can stay in the air for quite a while. Uh, it's periporate, 
generally has less than 15 pores uh, so that it's not confused with quinopons. Most other plantains is a little bananas. Yeah, well, that's a different plantain, but this is this is family uh, Plantago, and that uh, that's one of the banana families. I can't remember the name right now, but this is yeah, this so this is really plantain uh, weed, and this of course is ragweed, and and ragweed just looks really spiky here, um, so that the spikes. Uh, I mean, a ragweed just looks nasty. It looks like it could be something that irritates your nose, and it really does irritate at least my nose. The ragweed comes comes in two types. This is the short ragweed, and basically it has the fine leaf here, and then this is the giant or tall ragweed, and has a much uh, much coarser leaf. But uh, both of these produce pollen that look very similar, and both of them produce the major ragweed allergen, which is ambate one. Uh, and then kinopod, and kinopod is really a large group. Uh, kinopod is the Latin for goose foot, and if you look at the bottom of these, uh, they kind of fold over like that, especially when they get dry. And if you've ever looked at a goose or a duck swim from below, you'll notice their foot kind of goes like that and pulls through the water. And, and so these are called uh, goose foot. Uh, and these are the weeds that pick up all kinds of common names. Uh, people come in and say, I'm allergic to ironweed, or I'm allergic to duckweed, or I'm allergic to uh, pigweed, or, or uh, all kinds of things. And they are in the kinopod and the amaranth family, and, and the nomenclature people are still arguing over whether all the amaranths should be called kinopods, or which kinopods should be in amaranth, and which amaranth should be in kinopod. Uh, so we kind of kind of group them all together and pretty much call them kinopods, and uh, they'll pick up names like lamb, lamb's quarters and pigweed and things like that. Uh, okay, so those are the major pollen. Uh, indoors, we sample mostly for spores, and uh, I was going to go over the the reasons we sample indoors for spores, but mostly we're looking for fungi indoors, and you can get in a pretty good argument about how significant indoor fungus really is. Uh, we, of course, have uh, long supported the theory that indoor fungus is very important, especially for allergies and asthmatics. Uh, there are people that will argue that indoor fungi are really not very important for allergy and asthmatics. Um, but regardless, if you have a lot of indoor fungi, they are eating your house because they basically, they're, they're saprophytes, they're growing on the wood that is the structural material of your house, and so uh, if if I I can't if I can't appeal to somebody on the basis of well this mold may be making your child sick I can generally appeal to somebody on the basis of well this mold is eating the wood in your house and you're losing the value in the structure and generally at that point they'll decide it's worth fixing the mold okay so we can do air sampling indoors. Uh, indoors is a little different than outdoors. Outdoors, we sort of feel like everything's sort of uniform. I mean, there's air moving around and things like that. Whereas indoors, you may not be uniform, so we'll fight sample in several different areas. Um, indoors, you normally have a sampling strategy. Uh, you set a hypothesis. The hypothesis might be something like there's a lot, there are a lot of spores in the air, and they're causing children problems or uh, you know, there's spores in the basement and they're getting into the rest of the house or something like that. And you sample to either prove or disprove that hypothesis. Okay, you can sample indoors for viable spores or for non-viable spores. Um, generally, non-viable spores are counted by direct microscopy, whereas viable spores, you generally have to culture them. And you can, up in the laboratory, you'll notice under the hood, I've got, you know, I've generally got some, several petri dishes of spores growing, and those are from viable cultures uh, taken in houses and, and things like that. And, and we do studies comparing viable cultures to non-viable cultures and along those lines. But each has its own strengths and weaknesses. Uh, non-viable, you're limited only to fungal genus, whereas if you've got a viable colony, if you want to take the time, you can get right down to species level. Uh, for non-viable, it's generally quicker. You don't have to wait three days for it to grow. For viable cultures, 
uh, you have to wait three days, and different species have different growth rates. And so, if, or I, if I've got a viable culture, and there's something like uh, like um, FOMA on there, it grows really fast, and it can grow over the whole plate. And so, you know, just one type of one colony can actually take over the whole plate. And so, the viable tends to be a little more sensitive to what kinds of spores, whereas the non-viable it sees all spores. But some spores you just can't identify. However, there are things that won't grow on a culture plate. I mean, basidia spores basically don't grow on a culture plate. And so, uh, you know, so you don't see basidia spores in a viable sampling. And so they, they each have their, their pluses and their minuses. And these are some of the uh, collectors used. This is the allergenco that we looked at before, and this is the new allergenco, or this is actually an aerosol. But basically what they did is they took the top portion here, put a small plastic backing on it, hook it up to a vacuum device, and you pull air through it at a certain rate. And then uh, this is a one-time only collector that's sent to the laboratory. The laboratory cracks it open, takes out the small slide that's in there, and looks at that microscopically, and then at the end everything gets thrown away. And then this is a multi-stage collector for viable plates, and so you, in each one of these stages you would put a Petri dish, and what impacts on that Petri dish, you get the large spores impacting first, and you have successively smaller holes as you go down through here, and the smaller spores will impact in the latter stages. And so this is like a seven-stage Anderson sampler for viable collections. Uh, this is a one-stage sampler for viable collections. This is a disposable one-stage sampler for viable collections. This is a slit sampler for viable collections where you put a Petri dish on here and the dish rotates under the slit uh, in a certain period of time. And so you can actually do time studies on this. And this is a rotary where a, the auger is actually coated on a strip that's around the outer side here. And air is brought in and spun around this so that spores go impacting into the auger that's around the outside, and then the auger is pulled out and, and the spores are allowed to grow. So there are lots of different collectors. There are personal collectors um, here for, this is a seven-stage collector that actually is quite small and can be worn by an individual. And so you can, you know, if you can talk somebody into it, you can put, put an air pack on them and a little tube and get right in their breathing zone and collect exactly what they're being exposed to. And there are viable and non-viable collectors that uh, can be used for this. And we have some of these small pumps if you ever want to, if you want to do a study on somebody, if you can talk them into wearing a, uh, a little device here. Yeah. Okay, the top ten spores in our area are Cladosporums, Ascosporums, Basidia spores, Alternaria, Smuts, Epicoccum, Pithomyces, Rust, uh, the Bipolaris, Dreschleri, Homanthosporum group that all look the same, and the Aspergillus penicillium group that pretty much look the same. Okay, and, and you know, you guys know what these look like. The Cladosporum uh, grows in a line here, and so you'll find one that's maybe got one, two, three, four attachment sites on it here. And that's how you sort of pick out the Cladosporum. The Ascospores don't have any attachment sites because they grow in a bag or a sack. Um, Ascus is Latin for sack, and so uh, they grow in a sack uh, through uh, through a meiotic uh, life life cycle, and so they are dumped out at generally eight at a time, um, and they know they're not attached to one another. The basidia spores grow on the end of a stalk, and so basidia spores will have an attachment site, a place where the germplasm can get out. But also, since basidia spores grow on stalks that are beside each other, eight of them to a stalk, they are generally a little asymmetric. And plus, they typically have a fairly good color to them. Uh, Alternaria. Alternaria is, is a really characteristic spore. Uh, it grows on a, mycelial, on a mycelial bed here. And the spores just simply form as part of the line. And they have both transverse and longitudinal septi. They're quite large, and so we don't, really don't see a lot of alternaria in the air, 
But on a day like yesterday when we had a lot of strong wind, we get a lot of alternaria kicked up. Alternaria is the one spore type that's been strongly associated with asthma attacks and even asthma deaths in emergency room uh, asthma cases. And so it, it tends to be one of the most allergic types of spores. Uh, smuts. Smuts are plant pathogens. Uh, we have quite a few smuts in the air around here because we're an agricultural area. Uh, we have corn smut. It uh, gets in the air mostly when corn is harvested in October. And we have wheat smut that gets in the air when wheat is harvested in July. And uh, they grow on plants and on plants only. Uh, Epicoccum is another large spore, kind of like alternaria, that we don't see a lot of in the air, but if we get a lot of disturbance, a lot of strong winds, we can get a lot of epicoccum. It looks like a little soccer ball. Uh, Pithomyces, again, is a larger spore that has both transverse and longitudinal septations in it. And again, you see a lot of that uh, when we get uh, more things airborne, uh, a lot of wind and things. Uh, rusts, again, are plant pathogens. And um, the rusts uh, uh, grow on wheat. We have wheat rust. And, and we even have apple rust, apple cedar rust, which is a fungus that spends part of its life cycle on the cedar tree, part of its life cycle on, an, on apple trees and produces a very characteristic yellow spot on the apple tree. Uh, Bipolaris, Stretchularia, Helminthosporum, uh, they all pretty much look the same. They, they have these sort of pseudo-septi in them. Uh, and you really can't tell the difference between these guys until you watch them uh, start to grow. And, and if you know, one of them starts to grow, it will actually send a, a, uh, the first mycelia out the end, and another one will send it out the side, and another one will send it off another characteristic place. And so you can tell, you can't really tell them apart until you start to look very closely at the way they grow. And then this is Aspergillus and Penicillium. Uh, this little structure right here that kind of goes around is known as an aspergillum. You know what else an aspergillum is used for? If you, if you watched them install the new pope a couple of years ago, you saw the guy walking down the aisle sprinkling holy water to one side. He's got a little uh, metal uh, utensil that's shaped just like this, and that's known as an aspergillum. And so when uh, this is aspergillus, then it grows off an aspergillum structure. It grows from the aspergillum structure, it grows a small finger, and then this becomes spores. And, and these things pop up in the air, fall over, they'll start growing somewhere else, they'll pop up in the air and fall over. And so on, some, on something like a petri dish, they can move pretty fast. Uh, penicillium, uh, the spores, you'll notice, look very similar. They're quite small and really sort of on the margin of what you can see with a typical light microscope. But it produces finger-like structures. And on the end of these finger-like structures, the spores are produced. And so if I'm growing these, I can tell them apart. If I'm just looking at them on a non-viable air sample, I can't tell them apart. And so you'll notice for my non-viable reports, I'll just say Aspergillus penicillium, because the spores look very characteristic. Whereas on the viable uh, reports, I can tell them apart. If I see the finger-like structure, I will call it penicillium. If I see the aspergillum-type structure, I'll call it aspergillus. Okay, and then there are lots of other collectors. And this is a collector that collects into a liquid sample. And basically, you're pulling in air from the ambient air. You're spinning it around in a liquid here. And the spores stay in the liquid, and the air gets pulled out the top. And we have used this <coughs> to compare what's in the air. Uh, this is an enzyme immunoassay determination of how much ragweed allergen was in the air at any particular time. And this is the corresponding uh, air collection from the roof of the hospital. And these were collected uh, right apart at 8 o'clock in the morning. This, is, this represents the 8 o'clock reading. And this represents a collection that was made from 8 uh, to about 8.15 or so. And so we're looking at the amount of, this is the ragweed pollen in the air, and this is the amount of measured ragweed allergen in the air. And you'll notice it corresponds sometimes, 
But sometimes we actually have a fair amount of ragweed in the air, but not a lot of major ragweed allergen in the air. And so this has been known for a long time. Uh, the pollen grains tend to break open and disperse small particles into the air that actually contain the allergen. And so our pollen counts are really just a surrogate for when you can find stuff in the air. In other words, if you don't see pollen in the air, you probably won't find any allergen in the air. But if you do see pollen in the air, there might not be that much allergen in the air. But generally there is. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. <coughs> We're going to uh, pause for about a couple of minutes while we uh, change gears and then we'll be back on we'll be to start our next session where we meet the president of the American Academy of Allergy and the American College of Allergy. Uh, this has been Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time. <laughs>